On this week's Arabidopsis Research Roundup, I'm delighted to be joined by Daniela Dietrich and Malcolm Bennett from CPIB at the University of Nottingham. And we're going to be talking about a paper recently published in Nature Plants, the title of which is Root Hydrotropism is Controlled via a Cortex-Specific Growth Mechanism. So thanks very much, guys, for joining me today. And uh, it'd be great if you could give us uh, an overview of the, of the paper, please. Thanks very much for, for choosing this paper this week. Um, we're really excited about the paper. It represents a culmination of, a, of uh, almost eight years' work. And so we wanted to understand uh, how roots forage for water uh, in soil. Um, and um, classically, people like Darwin and Sachs have described a mechanism called hydrotropism that mediates this. And uh, we want to understand more about the signals and the mechanisms that control it. And so we worked working with a Japanese group, uh, Professor Hideyuki. We used uh, laser ablation to actually identify initially the part of the root which sensed the water gradient. So you can imagine that roots can sense where the water is available within the soil. Um, and classically, people have thought this is the root tip that mm -hmm. mediates this. But what was really nicely shown using laser ablation uh, it isn't the tip at all. Um, it's not the meristem. In fact, the results uh, were able to conclude it was the elongation sound. Mm -hmm. So if you ablate uh, the cap or the meristem, the roots are still able to undergo hydrotropism, which was a real surprise because classically, from Darwin onwards, everyone thought that the, essentially the cap was um, the nose or the way the plant actually, the root sensed uh, water distribution. And that doesn't appear to be the case. So that was using this kind of laser ablation-based approach, uh, and we also backed it up independently using um, molecular genetic approaches, which uh, my co-worker Danielle is going to talk about. Yeah, we were interested in, in really working out uh, which are the molecular um, mechanisms involved in that. And on the one hand, it was known that um, ABA is important for the hydrotropism response, um, and that Japanese group had isolated the gene um, called MIS-1, uh, which is also important in the response. Um, and what we did to find out which tissues are important for the hydrotropism response was to um, put those genes back in the mutant background uh, under the control of tissue-specific promoters. Okay. And... Um, for other plant hormones, we already know, for example, that for auxin, the epidermis is important, or for GA, at the endodermis is controls the root growth. And for ABA, it was quite interesting to see that when we expressed um, a kinase called SNOC22, which is important in ABA signaling, um, under the control of tissue specific promoters, we could rescue the response only by expressing it in the cortex. Okay. So um, that shows quite nicely that the different plant hormones act really on different tissues within the root to control this response. And that the cortex is important was also shown by that Japanese group doing the similar experiments for MIS-1. And there again, just if you express MIS-1 in the cortex, that is able to rescue the hydrotropism response. Okay. So... From the ablation experiments, we know um, that the elongation zone is important, and from the tissue-specific um, experiments, we know it's a cortex within that tissue, and that's really the, the, the tissue driving the response. Okay. Yeah, so absolutely. I mean, it, as, as you highlighted, Malcolm, that it's, it's really striking in the paper that it's not the meristem, and it is this other part of the, part of the root, which, was, which is certainly unusual. So it's really interesting also that it's, it's this, these cortical cell layers. So you, do you have any idea about the signaling which is going on specifically in those cells, which isn't occurring elsewhere in the root files, uh, in cell files in the root? Well, as, as um, Daniela pointed out, I mean, the link with ABA is really significant. A, we know ABA is a water stress response signal, a classic signal, um, and our current kind of working model is that um, essentially the ABA response machine in the cortex may act like a perimeter fence, which um, you could imagine that ABA is known to be synthesized uh, in the inner tissues, the vascular tissues, and it's possible that changes in water flow 
may result in ABA backflowing um, uh, into, um, into these active tissues. So imagine if water is limiting on one side of the root, um, mm -hmm. there's going to be less, uh, less water uptake by the root on this side, and there may be backflow of ABA, which is sensed by this perimeter fence of, of ABA response in the mm -hmm. cortex. And we think that triggers um, cell expansion. Remember, roots grow away from um, uh, the side which is exposed to, uh, to water stress. Okay. So, okay. And what we were able to, everyone thinks ABA is a, is a growth inhibitor. Well, it is when you put it on very high concentrations. Mm -hmm. But actually at low concentrations, Daniela showed very nicely that ABA actually promotes root growth at low concentrations. So what we think is happening is that, that essentially you're creating this exposure to the root to uh, differential water availability is going to have a knock-on effect to what ABA distribution in the root on one side to the other. And then at the cortical cells acting like a perimeter fence, uh, will detect changes in old ABA concentration, uh, which obviously will stimulate a differential growth response, much like you have during gravitropism mm -hmm. with the oxygen. But in this case, we're linking uh, water uptake um, and ABA distribution. Mm -hmm. Now, remember that most of water uptake takes place in the elongation zone, yeah. which again reinforces why hydrotropism, why you would sense hydrotropism it makes well. It does make sense. Uh, the laser ablation experiments, and the tissue specific rescue experiments, do make sense in terms of uh, this 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 result. So you mentioned about the signalling aspects. So do therefore does this link to water transporters in those in those tissues specifically? That's probably something we we want, really want to look into okay. in the future um, because yes, obviously aquaporins might be. Um, contributing to this response. What I find really interesting is in gravitropism classically, um, you know, you've got your sensing tissue at the tip, uh, with the, the columellas, which contain the statoliths, which drop in response to gravity. Mm -hmm. That triggers a lateral oxygen gradient. That's mobilized back through the root cap and the, uh, to the epidermal cells and the elongation zone. And it's a classic cologne went hypothesis. Um, and everyone thought that, that hydrotropism was, was, was kind of organized in a similar fashion. And I, I think the idea that essentially it's all taking place in the elongation zone uh, is a surprise. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, but when you think about where water's taken up, it actually isn't. Uh, and what the plant's done is combine, uh, we think, the uh, uh, water uptake with ABA distribution. Now, the latter is purely a hypothesis. Mm -hmm. At the moment, we are not able to visualize ABA gradients. Right. Um, um, so we're not able to validate that uh, gradient idea until uh, those kinds of uh, sensors are available. Just as a final question, maybe slightly speculative, which, which also links in some of the other work going on at CPIB. So you mentioned this perimeter fence sort of idea. So that, that sounds analogous to the role that Casparian strip plays in the endodermis. So could there be a link? That, so those tissues are next to each other. Could there be a link between water relations and you know, nutrient uptake? And things? I'm sure there is a link, but have you got any sense of you know, what that relationship might be? Yeah, I mean, that's a very interesting question. Um, uh, David Salt, who's recently arrived at CPIB, and, and Nico Geldner had a beautiful paper in Cell where they showed that the Casparian strip properties could change depending on water availability okay. in the outer tissue, in the externally. So uh, this is controlled through ABA and ethylene. And I think that they're, they're, uh, if you think about the elongation zone, though, what you've got there are rapidly expanding cells, they don't want the straight jacket that the Casparian strip would, 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 would confer. Um, so you have to have different ways of, um, of you know, contro controlling this pro these processes. Mm -hmm. So um, I, think, I think the Casparian strip is a really interesting uh, um, uh, structure, um, and which obviously covers the majority of the root. Mm -hmm. the, the root tip is very different. I mean, obviously, you've, you've got to have... All the cells in the elongation zone have to expand, but ultimately, at the very end of the elongation zone, they, they start to develop the Casparian strip, which mm -hmm. David Salt and Nico Gelman have beautifully illustrated in yeah. their work. Okay, cool. <laughs> well, excellent. So it sounds like, as ever, there's, there's lots of ongoing work in this, in this area. So thanks very much, uh, Malcolm and Daniela, for, uh, for chatting with us today.